Hi, this is Pastor Velcro, and I am uh, re-recording Wednesday night's lesson. A couple of you asked for it. Um, we had some issues uh, Wednesday night, and I've still got issues today. I was going to do this live feed, um, and probably on YouTube, but I haven't figured that out yet. So I'm just going to record it for you and upload it. Um, this class is intended to provide an overview uh, of Christianity from the time of Christ to today. Uh, we're we're going to focus on political changes within the church structure, um, formation of various denominations, churches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We won't begin to exhaust the history of Christianity. That's a study for scholars who are going to spend months or even years on their study. We're going to focus on the divisive issues and trying to understand those issues in order to better understand the teachings of the modern church, what we believe. Um, so you'll, you're going to receive greater benefit from this study if you exert yourself and study outside of the class time. Of course, that's always true. One note we need to be aware of is that Christianity is based on Judaism. And we need to have a good understanding of Judaism if we're going to look at and understand Christian, Christian theology. However, we're only going to take a very quick look at Judaism at the time of Jesus. And this study will not be covering Judaism as a whole. Um, this, And I'm, I'm warning you right now, this is probably going to be the most boring of this entire series. I'm going to throw out a lot of facts and figures. I want to get you an idea of what the world was like then. Uh, for instance, the population of Palestine. Um, what do you think? How many people were in Palestine? And by Palestine, I mean basically the area of the 12 tribes. Um, you know, and I'm using multiple historical sources, trying to take the most accurate and the best and the most commonly accepted. Um, so when we, we look at these, we get a wide variety of numbers. Um, some of these people can differ from each other by as much as 500 to 1,000 percent, maybe more. Um, you know, and, and so we, we need to look at this. Compare the Holy Roman Empire, as it's often called, or just the Roman Empire. At the time of Christ, it was probably around 100 million people. And Rome itself was over a million, probably about 1.2 million people. Um, so then how big would Palestine have been? Well, 100 million people in Rome, say 2 million people in Palestine. Uh, about half of those were Jews, maybe a little less. Uh, Rome had a million too. <clears throat> Jerusalem, well... Numbers vary anywhere from 20,000 to 2.7 million, making it bigger than Rome by more than double. Now, it was probably around 600,000 or half of Rome. Uh, how would you like to live in one of those cities with no plumbing, no sewers, no garbage or trash collection? Yeah, all the rich people, they lived out in the country. <laughs> um. So when we, uh, when we look at, uh, for instance, the birth of Christ, and King Herod had all the baby boys uh, killed in Bethlehem, um, how big do you think Bethlehem was? Um, Bethlehem and Nazareth, where Jesus was raised, were both probably around the same size. If you ask people to guess, they're going to say 2,000, 10,000, 20,000, something like that. Um, historians tell us probably around 300 people. So when Herod had all those baby boys killed, and Hollywood shows these people running all over the city, crying and screaming and sobbing, and, you know, dozens and dozens of mothers sobbing. Uh, yeah, it was probably, it could have been as few as five boys, maybe 10, probably not much more than 20. Uh, you do the math on population, but with 300 people, uh, assuming half of them are children, 150 adults, less than half of those would be men, be 
because men kill each other in wars. So let's say we have about 60 couples. Um, yeah. You're not going to have a lot of babies that are under two years of age. So, um, and, oh, speaking of numbers in uh, Palestine, I said about half, you know, maybe a little under a million Jews there. Um, some estimates say that between the Assyrian captivity um, and the Babylonian captivity and the Persian captivity and uh, just general moving because of business, that 50 to 75 percent of the Jews that were alive at the time of Christ actually lived someplace else. Um, some is there is a colony as far away as India, um, and we know that uh, uh, Egypt had a very large population of Jews in Alexandria, and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, a million Jews in. Um, Palestine, yeah, probably a million, million and a half elsewhere. Um, and people in those days were divided along different lines, you know, just like we do today. Um, you had uh, people divided by um, economic status. You have the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class. Well, not really. You had the upper class, which is 10% or less. And you have the lower class, which is like pretty much 90%. And then just a very few that were in the middle class. There was no real middle class. Uh, those would have been the skilled tradesmen. Um, but most people were uh, hard labor. And even the skilled tradesmen didn't typically make a lot of money. Um, religions. Um, Judaism, of course, for the Jews. And as far as other religions went, there was a multitude of other religions. Um, the most uh, significant one was the Roman religion, where they worshipped the emperor. <laughs> and that becomes an issue during uh, later lessons. Um, what race were people in Palestine at this time? Well, Middle East. <laughs> um, there were also... Probably the second largest group were from Africa, and uh, not too many from Europe. Uh, sexual divisions, of course, the country is divided male and female, and males pretty much dominated the world, but females outnumbered the males, as I said before, due to decimation of war during wars and such. Uh, politics were a little bit interesting. Uh, Rome pretty much let everyone rule themselves if they were governed by uh, Rome. And uh, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, now, a lot of these divisions overlapped each other. You know, the wealthy were more involved in the politics. The poor didn't have time. Poor had little or no time for religion either. Um, they, they didn't have education. Um, of course, we know about the division between Jews and Gentiles. Um, and that frequently involved politics. Um, and in some cultures in those days, women were not allowed to participate in politics or religions. Um, so, you know, and of course, then in some cultures, uh, women led the uh, religions. <coughs> Judaism. There were uh, many different groups uh, of Jews. The ruling council of the Jews was called the Sanhedrin, and uh, there were basically 70 uh, members of the Sanhedrin. That's called the Great Sanhedrin. It meets at the Jerusalem Temple. But there were also other Sanhedrins. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but local Sanhedrins typically had 23 judges, as they were called, um, at each local Sanhedrin. And... Uh, you know, they had some authority over regional stuff. You know, for the Jews, it's not just religion, it's politics too. Um, but with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, all the genealogical records are destroyed. Uh, people can't prove who and what they are, you know, based on ancestors. And, and that was important to the Jews. 
Um, so the Sanhedrin was disbanded in, in basically in 70 AD. And for the next 300 years, they're going to, some people are going to try and reform it. Uh, some with more success than others, but nobody was really successful. And about 300 years later, um, it was gone. We'll talk about that in a later lesson. Um, so many of the Jews today still try and follow the same basic traditions as their ancestors did 2,000 years ago with a wide variety of practices. So the biggest force at the time of Christ was called the Pharisees, meaning separate. And uh, about the time of Christ, um, scholars and historians estimate the number of Pharisees to be around out of a million plus people in Palestine. And they were the biggest group and they controlled the line. About 6,000 people. That surprised me. I expected more. Uh, they had a lot of followers. They had more followers than anybody else. Um, and that is the basis. Their, their beliefs are the basis of what's called Orthodox Judaism today. Um, they followed the uh, not just the Mosaic Law, but the traditions of the elders. Um, which were additional writings. Um, they tended to be fairly well off, but they were not the wealthy people, for the most part. Um, the Sadducees, um, and their name comes from their founder's name, but uh, when compared to the Pharisees, they were extremely wealthy, better political connections, um, but they numbered far fewer than the Pharisees did. Um, in actual numbers are hard, hard, hard to find. The words used are often translated as few or not very many. Um, and I cannot give you an actual number. Um, the The best number I, I found was less than 300. Um, so, you know, there weren't a lot of them. They were considered very liberal because they followed the Mosaic Law, but nothing else. Um, and some of their other beliefs. A lesser-known group was called the Essenes. So you don't hear about them too much. Probably about 4,000 of them at the time of Christ, um, and they're considered the creators of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They preferred to be isolated, have nothing to do with anyone. They didn't even want to go to the marketplace. They didn't want you to come to their marketplace. Um, isolationist big time. Another group was called the Samaritans. You've probably heard about them. Um, they call themselves the Shomerin, which is a Hebrew word meaning observers, as in or observers of the God's law. Um, they were typically, you call them half breeds. I mean, they were they were uh, Jews that had intermarried with uh, Gentiles. Um, not all, but you know that's the majority of them. Um, basically, they came out of the ten tribes. They had a small family of Levites. It was part of their um, area. And uh, at the time of Christ, they probably numbered quite a bit under a million people. I'm not sure how much under. Um, but, uh, yeah. 400 years ago, I found some numbers. Said they numbered less than 150. But uh, in 2003... I found a survey that said they now had about 655 members. Um, their name for God is Shema, um, which means the name. And if you understand uh, Jewish traditions, Deuteronomy 6.1, uh, we often say that starts the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, same word, Shema. That's what we call that, the Shema. Um, uh, their religious practices were very similar to the Jews. I'm not going to go into that right here. Um, and you've probably heard about proselytes or converts to Judaism. There's another term that you don't hear about much, and you should. It's called God-fearers. These are Gentiles who believed in God but hadn't converted to Judaism. These two groups, but especially the God-fearers, were a large part of the earliest con converts to Christianity especially those that came from outside of the Jews' uh, culture, the Jew, Jewish nation. 
So early Christians, by the way, were considered a sect of Judaism. Um, and at first they got ignored by Rome because of that. Now they're just weird Jews. <laughs> um, so the vast majority of early converts to, to Christianity that were Jews still remain faithful to their Jewish practices. Um, so that, that was... So that was, uh, you know, um, there were there were uh, other uh, people that were called Nazarenes, um, and oftentimes these um, Jewish Christians were called Nazarenes. Um, another group of Christians was called the Hellenists. That was a word that non-Greeks used or even Greeks used, to talk about somebody who wasn't a Greek that embraced the Greek culture. When used regarding Christians, Hellenist typically meant uh, somebody that um, was a Gentile um, that became a Christian. And one more group I want to name out. Uh, uh, most of us can probably relate to this group. Um, uh, an early portion of Christianity, a sect, if you will, uh, was a fairly large group. They were called the Ebionites, and they were Jewish Christians that adhered to the Jew Judaic law, but that word Ebionites means poor. So the majority of them were Christians who were raised in Jerusalem and devout to Jewish practices. Of course, there were other religions, uh, they were significant. I'm not going to go into those. There were great many. The Greeks in particular had different groups called the Cynicism, the Skepticism, the Platonism, the Epicureanism, the Stoicism. And, and beyond that, beyond the, the Greeks, you had the uh, what's often called the mystery religions. So you had Mithraism and Eleusian men. And those are those are groups that um, they they believe that you had to have some secret uh, right or some pat way to get in that was super secret until you knew what was going on. And and uh, the Romans and others often thought Christians were a mystery religion because they had this secret right where they eat the body and drink the blood. And so they got to be cannibals or something. It, caused, it did, did cause some confusion. In Egypt, you had Isis, Isis and Osiris. Um, um, among Christians, uh, the biggest group that was uh, John in particular was arguing against was Gnostics. Um, basically, they believed that um, there's a difference between God that created and the God of our world. Um, they call them emanations. God that created was so perfect that he couldn't touch any of us. So he created another God who created another God, created another God, and so forth, until there was a God that was evil enough to create us. <laughs> um, they also got their name because they believed they had special knowledge and Gnostic uh, comes from the Greek word uh, gnosis, which means knowledge. And interestingly, the uh, the word agnostic, meaning without knowledge, uh, was derived by a, a man named Thomas Huxley in 1871 to describe his view, meaning he opposed the spiritual knowledge taught by Christians. Gnosticism came in many forms. Um, and I'm not going to go into them. They're in my notes here. But Docetism, Marconi, Marcionism, Arianism, Apollinarianism, Donastism, Montanism. Um, just little variations. Um, some a little more than others. So in the first century, uh, Christianity, of course, begins with the story of Christ. Well, I'm documented in the four Gospels and we're going to skip over those books uh, for now, at least. Um, but for a time frame, Jesus died of, considered around 30 AD. The date is debated. 
And then come the book of and then comes the book of Acts, and it's the beginning of the church. It starts with the story of the disciples in Jerusalem and follows the spread of Christianity from not just from Jerusalem out, but from Judaism and out, um, including especially the story of Paul and his reaching the uh, Gentiles. And we're going to skip over that for the most part right now. That's not what this study is about. We'll come back to the scriptures later. Um, so our story here really begins around 65 to 70 AD. 70 AD is the destruction of Jerusalem. And that was significant for Christianity because um, it caused Christian, it caused Jews to scatter from Jerusalem. But a lot of those were Christians, and that's called a, another dispersion, like the earlier ones I mentioned, uh, the diaspora. So um, the center of Christianity kind of moved from Jerusalem to Antioch of Syria, which was probably less than half the size of Jerusalem, but close. And uh, by 400 AD, um, it was said that Antioch was half of the people living there were Christians. I found that very interesting. Um, so an, another very interesting region that I barely mention is, is part of what we call Asia Minor today, uh, northwest corner of uh, Turkey. It's called Bithynia. Bithynia, whatever. Um, and these people embraced Christianity very fast. Uh, it was right on the edge of the region that we call Galatia, or they called it Galatia back then. And so that's where Paul wrote the book of Galatians. I don't know why I included that in here, but I did. So I say it. Um, Rome was the center of the world. Um, it's estimated that by 250 A.D., less than 3% of Rome's population was Christian. Um, so, you know, in, in the ancient world, uh, cities were the center of society regardless. Um, and remember, the majority of Christianity's converts came from the lower levels of society. And that makes sense because the upper crust, um, they're content with their life. They don't need anything. Uh, they see no reason for change. So embracing a religion is for the people that want something to change. Um, next week, we're going to look at the spread of Christianity to Africa. It's, it's an interesting study because in Africa, even the upper crust, the upper levels of society, um, embrace Christianity to a large extent. And uh, we're going to talk about Africa, North Africa. Uh, next week, and, and we'll cover that for the most part from the time of Christ to today, and, and we won't refer back to Africa too much. It, this uh, discussion next week is going to include, though, the first really major split of Christianity, which is why we ended up with Africa being quite quite a bit different. Um we had a lot of martyrs in the early days, people that were killed for their faith. Um, Justin Martyr, again, that's where we get the name, um, and so on and so forth. Um, Rome, at first, was very tolerant of, of Christianity, as I mentioned earlier. But when they began to understand what Christianity was all about, their tolerance ended. Done. Um, and, you know, they didn't really object so much to the fact that the Christians wouldn't worship their emperor as they objected to um, that the Christians were seeking converts. And to Rome, that's almost like an invading army. Um, so martyrdom became rather commonplace when Nero blamed the Christians for the great fire in Rome in 64 AD. And yes, that really happened. All right, so I'm going to put some questions out on the internet for homework questions. Um, I'm going to talk about monks and monasteries. 
And the second question is the one I'd really like you to focus on. If the, the question is, is more a topic, I call it here. Describe the nature of Jesus. Was he human? Was he God? Was he both God and man at the same time? Was he only God for part of his earthly life? Was he only man for part of his earthly life? And just explain what you think. Because I'm going to tell you, a lot of the early splits, that was what they were talking about. The nature of Jesus. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that next week and later on. Topic number three, uh, explain the Gnostic beliefs, why they were a danger. And topic number four is interesting. And whether you've studied it or not, why don't you try and write down what a typical church service would have been like, say, in 80 A.D.? Um, where did they meet? When did they meet? Um, what would their service look like? Um, and then by 200 AD, how would that have changed? Interesting uh, way to think. You go through questions like that and you'll learn more than you ever would by just listening to me ramble. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, you take care of yourself. God bless. And I look forward to seeing you again. Bye.